Thank you so much. It's really wonderful to see you all here. Glad you could join me um, tonight, especially with the weather as kind of crazy and unpredictable as it is these days. I kind of like it though. Um, so we have a little gathering here. It's really nice that we're able to gather and share this music together. Um, the instrument I, I play, the oboe, is kind of famous for gathering people together. At the beginning of an orchestra concert, of course, we give the tuning note, and that signals to the audience that the concert's about to begin, everyone get in your seats and get quiet, whatever. Um, but it also signals for the musicians on stage all the diff disparate instruments of the orchestra, um, brass, woodwinds, percussion, everybody, uh, harmonize together, get in tune with each other, let's come together. And um, I think after all that we've been through the past couple of years, it's just really nice to have a gathering like this where we can just share beautiful music together. And um, tonight, actually I, I want to mention one of the pieces tonight, the second one I'll be doing by Dorothy Rudd Moore. She actually takes advantage of this tuning phenomenon of the oboe. She seemed to have understood it. The piece actually starts with the tuning note A. And then from that A unfolds the principal motive that actually unifies the entire piece, the set of 12 songs that she wrote. Um, so tonight, uh, four different pieces, very different musical styles. They're all relatively new pieces. Dorothy Rudd Moore's is the oldest piece written in the 1960s, but has hardly ever been performed since then. Who knows what the reason is? We can speculate lots of reasons why. Um, but I think you'll hear tonight that it's actually a very fine piece, and I've really enjoyed getting to know it, as I've enjoyed getting to know all these pieces. Uh, different styles, there's some provocative things here, but for the most part, I think all these pieces are healing, and I think it's nice to be together and enjoy the healing power of music together. If you do want to find out more about these pieces, you hopefully all got programs, uh, but I did put the QR codes there. Um, and you can scan and get that on your phone. There's actually extra information um, there that's not in the printed program. And also for those of you who really are interested in these uh, composers and what they're doing, uh, I have all the links, hyperlinks, so you can find out as much as you want about them through those hyperlinks, which I encourage you to do. Um, I decided to do this uh, performance tonight as a way of uh, celebrating a milestone for myself, I realized I've been here at UNLV for 35 years, teaching and playing the oboe. So, uh, <laughs> and, um, there's a reason I've stayed here, because um, it's actually a pretty good place to be. <laughs> um, I decided to celebrate that 35-year milestone just doing what I've always done, playing new music, music by living composers for the most part, um, and American composers. Um, I've made a personal commitment to do that my entire career. Um, and some of my friends out in the audience that I see here, I know you have done that too. Um, it seems to be very trendy now that we're paying attention to these composers and I'm really happy that the rest of the world is starting to catch up with us now. Um, <laughs> to, do, to really pay attention and listen to these different voices because we have so many fine American compositional voices. Um, I also wanted to celebrate uh, the work I've done with students. So all the performers tonight on the program with me are people who have been students of mine over the years. Even the first uh, piece I'll be doing with Spencer Baker, he was in my class 25 years ago, and uh, he was a star back then. I think he was the only one in the class that actually turned all his assignments in on time. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm really enjoying sharing the stage with these people. Um, there will be an intermission after the first three pieces, um, and then the last half of the program is just a single piece that's about 20 minutes. Kincaid Rabb, one of our own graduates of UNLV, wrote a really uh, interesting piece that I think you'll enjoy. Um, and then I did want you to know that we will have a reception afterwards, 
And so don't bug us in the green room. We'll pack our stuff up really quickly and we'll get out there. But I'd love to talk to you and I know you, you probably will want to talk to some of these composers and performers as well. So um, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to toot a couple of notes back there, but I'll be back and we'll start the show in a minute. Okay, thank you.
while I was at Howard, um, Nadia Boulanger came to this country uh, to give it the famous Nadia to give it. I think she was conducting in Boston, and um, and then she was touring, and she gave a lecture at the State Department. A State State Department Auditorium is what it's called. So I decided to take myself over there, see what what's the big deal with this lady. <laughs> right. Because right. I really didn't know anything about her. Right. You, you'd heard of her, but... Yeah. And so... <laughs> I went, and she had, you know, her English was very accented with her French accent. And I always had this feeling, I'm an American, I don't stand for anybody, I don't curtsy, I don't stand. And I noticed they were treating her with such deference. When she finished speaking, I jumped to my feet of flying. She, yeah. she was Oh, she so impressed wow. me so much. Wow. But I didn't meet her, but that's how I found out about uh, the school at Fontainebleau, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote and applied, and make a long story short, I was accepted. So that's how I happened to go study with her. And I was very lucky because she was my composition teacher. Because other students, every student couldn't have her, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I see. Know. Is it right there at the castle at yes, Fontainebleau? in Fontainebleau? So Fontainebleau. you lived there in the the, in the, uh... um, the school. The the school is that whole area, and because uh, I've been there and I just found, found oh, yeah. it fascinating. It's like and on the and on the castle. streets around it is where the apartments were, or you know, for the students. I see. Yeah. Did you ever meet um, Louise Talma, people like that there? Well, that was before you. Yeah, it was, that was before, before my time. But the interesting thing, though, is that uh, Madame, uh, Mademoiselle Boulanger, when I was coming to New York, she gave me two names to get in touch with, Louise Talma mm -hmm. and Stéphane Volpe. Ah. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. But anyway, she was very encouraging. She, I've never forgotten. She looked at my so-called symphony number one. And she said, my dear, you're too young to write a symphony. <laughs> but I had written another piece, uh, the, which you've probably seen in there, the uh, songs from the Rubiat. Right. And I Is had, that the oboe? Yeah, it's voice and oboe. And that was supposed to be done on the concert at Howard by Evelyn White. And um, uh, the oboe's last name was White also, but they weren't related. But for some reason, it didn't take place. But at the same time, I was involved in a musical called Race for Space. Except I wrote the book and the lyrics and Adolphus Hailstork, you know his name, the composer. Sounds, sounds somewhat familiar. Yeah, he's, well, his music's been done on. Uh, he's not an ACA member. Uh, he wrote the music. And I also started it. So I had a very busy senior year with writing the symphony and this and that. But, um, she saw the songs for voice and oboe, and she really liked them. And so she told the proctor to come and tell me this. So he came one day in the lunchroom uh, to tell me that Mademoiselle would like to have, there are 12 quatrains that I said. You know, that, that book by Fitzgerald, the translation has 105 quatrains. And the biggest part was narrowing it down to just, I had 48, then I had 36, and then I got it to 12, and to make a continuous storyline with those, the, the, uh, using those 12 points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he said, now they had student concerts, but they had evening concerts in the Jeu de Pomme at Fontainebleau. Mademoiselle would like to have your work done on an evening concert. But she only wants six quatrains done. And I said, tell, my, tell Mademoiselle, we have to do the whole thing or we can't do it at all. Oh, wow. <laughs> so they did the whole thing.
passion let the credit go, nor heed the rumble of the distant drum.
So the composer of the last piece, Dorothy Brett Moore, um, passed away last year, so we only had her video presence. Uh, Phil, the composer of the first piece, is living in Chicago and couldn't make it here. But we're very fortunate that the composer of the next piece is here. And I'm so excited. He's one of our newest faculty members here at UNLV. So if you have born, please come up and uh, introduce you. I'm so honored to be on the faculty of UNLV. I've had a really amazing uh, year and a half so far. I felt so welcome. So thank you to all my colleagues and students for uh, having me be a part of your community here. So uh, this piece is a piece I wrote uh, 12 years ago. <laughs> uh, it's kind of almost, I think of it as my opus one. Uh, it's one of the oldest pieces I have that I still, you know, allow people to play. <laughs> uh, but it's a piece I, I still, like, when we rehearsed it uh, last week, it's a piece that I'm still very proud of. It's one of those uh, things you, like, one of those pieces you write when you're younger, and uh, it, I feel like it started this uh, obsession I have with double reeds. Um, I don't play the oboe or bassoon or English horn, but I play the clarinet, and I always joke that I wouldn't play the oboe if it wasn't so expensive. <laughs> um, so this piece really shows off everything that I love about double reeds. Uh, how beautiful they can sound, how crisp their articulation is, and um, how good they sound playing both fast and slow music. Um, so through these four movements, they're all very different from one another, but uh, I think they each show different sides of these instruments that I find beautiful. So I guess I'll say about it, but just thank you, Steve and Kareen and Ellen, for playing the piece so beautifully. Um, you're sweet. Thank you, everyone.
It's been really wonderful to have Kincaid Rabb back on campus, a recent grad of UNLV. He's um, written this terrific piece, chamber piece, that includes double reads with some other friends. So uh, Kincaid, take it. Welcome to Three Aviaries for Oboe English Horn Narrator and String Quartet. Uh, this work is intense and emotional. The text is not vulgar. But there are moments of force and aggression embedded in this work. There are two moments in which a psychological meltdown is simulated, uh, and you will experience the entire emotional envelope of what that is like for someone like me. If you are like me, you may find yourself uh, seeing a lot of yourself in this work. If you are not like me, and you are made to feel uncomfortable by this work, uh, we ask that you take some time after the performance to sit with and examine that discomfort. If, for any reason and at any time, you feel overwhelmed by this experience to the point where your participation will hurt you or you become, uh, or, or you become uncomfortable to a point that is not healthy, uh, you, of course, have the right to revoke consent at any time, and if that is the case, we, talk, we ask that we, you quietly leave uh, the hall at either side of the, um, at either exit in the back, um, and if that is the case, uh, I will do my best to try and find you after the performance um, and, uh, and uh, connect with you about anything that you may have, or may or may not have to say. Um, uh, this, uh, the experience takes about 20 minutes to perform, and movements will be performed without pause. Thank you, and enjoy three aviaries for Oboe, English horn, narrator, and 
and string quartet. It's so much to do.
quiet moments in between the confusing loudnesses. iconic character 
attacked Spud, biting him in the face a few times before he collapses to the ground and dies from the same place. While the Black Farmer's new talks a good and doesn't show one, but Daryl Hannah's character is that a read with the person in the Wikipedia article and Black Farmer's transcribed into a So, if you ever feel like Bud, suffering as I'm like Daryl Hannah's character, telling you fun facts about tea cultivation or read quintet music, tell me because I can't tell that you're dying from a stick fight. <laughs> to 
saying it when we talk about things we're passionate about. Most people would rather that people like me didn't socialize with them at all. Most people don't want to be compared to people like me. Most people think people like me will never grow up. And will always be the little kid walking back and forth in the corner or biting their nails. Most people look forward to a time in their lives when they don't have anyone like me around them or around their kids. Deep down, most people think people like me can be treated for who we are. And who we are can't be cured like disease. Most people think people like me can be trained to not be who we are. People like me cannot be trained like animals. And most people think people like me should do everything they can to acquire the same way to our society. If people think we can't assimilate to our society like robots, most people think people like me should be silent and invisible or eradicated. Most people don't want people like me to be people like me. Just enough sun.